Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Dating, being able to date an event in the past is just one aspect of, of time perception. Um, and there are others as well that are very, very relevant to the experience that Alan Johnston had. Um, he was in the street in Gaza uh, when a man got out of a car, pointed a gun at his head, forced him into the car and uh, kidnapped him and took him away to this room where he didn't know how long he would stay or, or whether he would um, survive. And not surprisingly, at that moment when the gun was to his head and he was getting in the car, time slowed down for him. And this is something that's very, very common that people will describe that they have this experience, this subjective experience, that time slows right down if they're in a, a terrifying situation. And this is what I'm interested in, why it is that our subjective experience of time warps. And it can happen in situations much, much less dramatic. If you're bored, time goes slowly. Uh, if you're uh, having lunch with some friends and you've just got 20 minutes to grab a quick sandwich and chat to them, that 20 minutes and then you've got to go back to work, that 20 minutes will go really, really fast. If your train is delayed by 20 minutes then that's really annoying and that same 20 minutes will go really slowly. It is the same 20 minutes but feels very different depending on um, exactly what's going on. So it's clear that time does warp, it plays all sorts of tricks on it, on us, that it seems to speed up as you get older as well as slowing down when you're afraid or that Holidays do very strange things. So on the first day, say, second day of your holiday, you do see all these new things, all these new places. The time seems to go really fast because you're really busy. But when you look back on that fortnight, say, or even just a week, you look back and it seems, feels as though you've been away ages at the same time as it goes really fast. There's this dual thing going on. And this is not the physics of time. This is about the subjective experience of time that we create for ourselves. Um, and... It does do slow down in all sorts of strange situations. A very odd situation is having a high temperature. So there was a, uh, an American psychologist called Hudson Hoagland who was working in the 1930s. Um, and he noticed one day that uh, his wife, who had flu, who he was caring for, she complained that every time he went down to the kitchen uh, to get her some water and so on, uh, she would say, he'd been away for ages and ages. Why won't you come back to me faster? Next time, rush back. And he insisted he really hadn't been taking ages at all. And like any good psychologist, he thought something strange was going on here, and this was an opportunity to do an experiment. So he got his poor, very patient wife to, um, constant, to repeatedly estimate um, a minute passing, and he would time her and see how long it took. And he would do this and then take her temperature. He ended up taking, doing this more than 30 times at different temperatures, getting her to estimate again when a minute had passed um, without counting. Um, and he found that the higher her temperature was, the more time slowed down for her. Um, and this is something that's been confirmed in research since, that having a high temperature is one thing that seems to slow down the perception of time. So a big question is, is why it is that it does this? Why it is that it warps in this strange way? And the reason is that we actively construct our experience of time, the experience that we all sort of know what time feels like. We actively construct that in our minds. Um, and we can sense time passing. We know we're very good at estimating a minute passing, in fact. We're quite good at estimating two hours passing, and we can hold in mind the years and the centuries passing as well. And what's amazing is that no single dedicated clock in the mind has been found that can do this. So there is, obviously, there's the body clock, which um, controls our sleep-wake cycle and in our 20, makes our cycle be 24 hours and is corrected by light every 24 hours. But this is completely different from that. So nobody can find a single dedicated clock. Um, and there's, so there's various um, thoughts about how we can do it. And it seems that we can do this whole range of things. We can go from the tiniest millisecond timings. So if you uh, put your hand on your voice box and you say, pa and ba, you do exactly the same thing with your mouth if you do pa and ba. The only difference is that with the pa, there's a very slightly longer delay between the P and the A than there is between the B and the A. And you can feel it's, it's a millisecond longer. But we're able to detect that, and that gives us, uh, enables us to understand language. So these milliseconds really matter. And yet at the other end, we can hold the idea of hours and days and weeks and, and years in mind. So 
There's various theories about why this might be. One of them is called the oddball effect. This is very well established within psychology. And the oddball effect gives you various objects, and you have to say which single one of these you thought flashed on the screen for longest. So who thinks one of the drafts was there for longest? Anyone, doesn't matter. Who thinks the drafts were there for longest? A couple of people there, a few people there. Who thinks the mango was there for longest? More people there. Who thinks they were there for the same amount of time? Clever bunch you get at the RSA, that's the trouble with here. Yes, they were there for the same amount of time. But if you do this repeatedly with lots of people, lots of people will think, more, far more people will think that the mango was there for longer. So this is known as the oddball effect. And when there's something new, we focus on it and we notice that. This has been used to try to, to work out what it is that allows us to measure time passing. And so one, seems to, one element, one factor is our attention on things, is where we focus our attention. So you've already seen the draft several times, so you don't need to focus your attention on it so much. The mango comes up again. It also shows how memory is involved, and memory is another of the big factors. So you, um, the giraffe is already there in your memory. The mango isn't, and it's a new picture. You've got to think about uh, recognizing that. So there's various theories about how we actually do this. Some people think there might be a whole series of clocks for different durations. So one theory is that there's a whole series of, of perhaps sort of hourglasses. Another theory is that there's this whole series of different clocks. Uh, the idea I like is that the brain is actually, because we can't find where these clocks are, that the brain is actually measuring the activity that's going on for something else, uh, which could be anything, which could be facial recognition. It could be anything. That it's taking the pulses that are already there and counting them up. So if you imagine sheep going through a gate, then the more sheep that go through, uh, as if, say, you're in a terrifying experience like Alan Johnston's, the more sheep go through because you're paying more attention to it and your emotions are very high, and we know emotion slows down time. More sheep go through the gate, so the counter then thinks that more time has passed because those pulses get speeded up, if you like. The brain's actual processes uh, get speeded up. And emotion is this third big factor that affects uh, our time perception. So there's attention and memory, and emotion is the big one. And another theory is that we're actually counting time by registering almost emotional moments. The sort of, how am I feeling now? How am I feeling now? How am I feeling now? And we're registering all those. And the more emotional those moments are, the more individual ones will get registered. And then we think again that time has slowed down. This one is going to show you two sh short videos. And I want you to remember everything you can in each of these short videos. So which video do you think was shown for the longest? Who thinks the video of the fence was shown for longer? Yes, a few of you there. Who thinks the video of the skaters was shown for longer? And who thinks they were the same time? Just catching on. Yes, they are the same time again. Most people think that the skaters are there for longer because there's much more going on. There's much more to focus your attention on. And then we think that makes us think that that's um, gone for longer. And this explains why when you walk to, say, you're walking to someone's house and you don't know the way, on the way there it seems really a long way. And when you walk back again, and it's already familiar, it seems much faster on the way back. And you think, oh, that doesn't seem that far at all. Because those things are already in your memory, and memory is affecting, again, your time perception and your attention to those details. You don't need to look at those details again if you've already um, remembered them, um, like you have here. Um, and in, what is, I think, extraordinary about time is that it's not just the seconds that we can hear, uh, that we can understand, and the minutes we can deal with much, much longer time frames than that. So we can think back years, decades. We can think back to the time before we were born. We have a concept. We're able to hold a concept in mind of, of centuries. Um, and I'm interested in how it is we conceptualize these in our minds. And it turns out that one in five people will actually visualize time laid out before them in their minds. Um, and this is considered to be a type of synesthesia called time-space synesthesia. Um, so it may be that you see... Uh, the year laid out uh, in an oval, um, or it may be that you see things stretched out before you. So this is a very straightforward one that many, many people have. I see time like this. I see the year like this as an oval. 
people had extraordinary ones. This was a guy called Roger, and he, this is how he sees his weeks and his weekends laid out. And the weekends are the big, uh, fat sort of uh, bits, and he's got Thursday on there like that. Um, and this is how someone saw the decades. The decades, very much in all these drawings, were much more distinctively uh, delineated, and so there'd be, there would be corners in there. To an extent, we all associate time with space. We all see time and space. So people will often be surprised that things seem to happen more recently than they think. And this has been quite well established, and it's, it's, there's lots of research on this, and it's, it's referred to as, as telescoping. And the idea that is that if we remember something well, we assume it happened recently, because we use clarity of memory as a guide to when something happened. Another thing people will often say is, oh, I know why time speeds up. It's because it's all about proportionality. And that a year when you're eight is an eighth of your life. A year when you're 40 is a 40th of your life. Again, that's more of a description of what happens, that people, it is very, very common to say life seems to be speeding up. It's more of a description than an explanation for what actually happens. Because if that were to hold, then by the time you're 40, um, one day would feel like one fourteen thousandth of your life, which means it should absolutely whiz by because that's nothing at all. It also means that if you were to live till 80, by the time you're 20, you would have lived half of your subjective life. So it doesn't, it doesn't quite hold the proportionality theory. It is, a, it, it is a description, but it's not how people actually experience life. People don't necessarily say that the days go really fast as they get older. Obviously, they do if you're busy. But it's the weeks and the years and the time. Uh, it's that you notice it's, it's almost summer again. It's almost Christmas again. Um, and that these things seem to repeat faster and faster and come around more and more. So I think it's due to, to what I call the, the holiday paradox. When you're on holiday, it seems to go fast at the time, but you look back and it seems to have gone slowly. Even if you just go away for a couple of days at a weekend, if you go away on the Sunday night, it feels like you haven't been at work for a while. If you stay at home, it seems it's Friday night and in no time it's, it's Monday morning and it's time to go to work again. If you apply this idea of the holiday paradox to how we look at time in our whole lives, the thing is that we look at time all the time prospectively, so what's going on now, and retrospectively. So if we're asking retrospectively, we're saying, how is it when I look back at it? Prospectively, how's it looking on now? If you really do want time to go faster, uh, to not go so fast, then you need to recreate the holiday paradox. So if you want the weekend to seem as if it's going slowly, then what you need to do is to fill it with new things. Because you're filling it with new memories then. So you go and do one thing on Saturday morning and something else on Saturday afternoon. And then you are filling it with all these new memories. And since we use memories as a guide to how much time has passed, then you'll think that the weekend has gone more slowly. Now, obviously, that does involve sacrificing uh, rest, I'm afraid, for doing lots of stuff. So you may just decide not to worry so much about time going so fast and, and to rest instead, which I have to admit is sort of what I do. Um, and that maybe it, it, it not to worry about it um, so much. Now, I notice that um, the clock is starting to beat me, and there's, there's lots more interesting things I could talk about. I'm very interested in mental time travel, how it is that we can... Uh, step back in our minds into the past just like that and then forwards into the future and why it is that um, I think the reason our memories are so unreliable and often let us down is actually to allow us to think forward into the future is to allow us to get those memories and make them very flexible so that we can imagine the future and we can imagine the future in ways that no um, no other animals can there's a wonderful interview with Dennis Potter towards the very end of his life and also I've been reading uh, the wonderful book that Philip Gould wrote uh, at the very end of his life. And they both describe something amazing and kind of transcendent that happens when you know you've got very little time to live and a kind of sense of seeing things in a way that they'd never seen things before because they don't have anything else attached to them other than the thing that they are. They have no other meaning for them because there is no meaning for them going forward. I'm interested in your kind of sense of what, what's going on yeah. when that happens. Well, what, what is really interesting is when the, some research has been done on, on the time perception of people when they're dying and when, when they know they're dying. And uh, interestingly, time does, you sh people often report that time does slow down in that circumstance, whereas you think it might speed up and that if someone might know that they have six months or a year to live, you think it would just seem like it went just like that. But people uh, seem to report often that time actually slows down. Or they report like this, that they've almost stepped outside time because they, it's taken away that whole idea of there being a, a future to imagine. If you look at um, uh, brain scanning studies, the default position of the brain often seems to be to be thinking about the future. So when we think we're doing nothing, 
Uh, if you get people to think about nothing, in fact, they think about the future. Um, and uh, people have tried to estimate that we'll, that in studies, that we think about the future 59 times a day on average. How on earth they quite work that out, I don't know. But um, that we think about it 59 times a day. And of course, if you're dying, that future is taken away. And so that default mode of keep thinking about the future isn't going to happen. And then people can find themselves living more in the moment in a way that the rest of us often try to live in the moment. And so, you know, you, people will have had that experience that you're, even on holiday somewhere really lovely, you think, oh, I must really enjoy this moment. This is really, really beautiful. And within seconds, you're looking in the book to see where it is you can go tomorrow and what, thinking about what you might eat tonight and what you might do. And it's very hard to enjoy that actual uh, moment and be in that moment. But often people, when they're dying, will, will step out of that and find that they can. The point that I think Daniel Dennett best made, which is that we're trying to cope with the modern world using a prehistorically evolved brain. I'm interested in your sense, therefore, of the degree to which our cognitive frailties around time are to do with the fact that we, for 190,000 years, time, the meaning of time was, was very different. For example, there wasn't really much of a long term because life just went on and on and on and there was not much point planning for the long term if you were a hunter-gatherer. So what's your, kind of, I, what's your kind of sense of the relationship here between what's what our, our perception of time and our kind of evolution? Well, it's interesting that we are very bad at predicting, uh, predicting the future and predicting particularly how we'll feel in the future. So there's a, a, a thing called the impact bias that uh, a guy, a psychologist called Daniel Gilbert's done a lot of work on and serve a lot of other people. And the impact bias is that we, we overestimate how we will feel about things in the future emotionally. So we think that the good things will make us happier for longer. So uh, something like getting the promotion you've really been wanting at work uh, the ha extra happiness from that seems to last on average about three months and then wear off. Um, and people predict that it will make them happier for much, much longer. They think it will change everything. Um, likewise, people predict that very uh, sad, terrible events will affect them forever, whereas in fact uh, their, their happiness levels might be like this and the good things will make it go up slightly and the bad things will make it go down very slightly, but they'll often come back to it. And the problem with the impact bias is that we... Um, and this could be because we haven't evolved enough to, to really consider the future very well and to make very good predictions about it. And we, what we do with the impact bias is that we focus on the, uh, the chief features of, of an event and the earliest features of it. So you get that job you've really been wanting and you imagine what you might do on your first day and in your first weeks there. And you also just think of the main thing of this new job. What you might not take into account is that you're leaving the place where you actually really like everyone you work with and that perhaps you've got a longer commute now. And, and these fringe bits of it, you don't consider so much in your, um, in your thoughts about how you'll do it. And the other thing, of course, we're very bad at about the future is, is planning how long things will take. Many of us have this belief that in the future we will have more time, and there's no evidence that you'll have more time free in the future unless you're going to change something, um, and that um, we'll be better, more organized versions of ourselves in the future. And so we'll be more organized about it. And so if someone said to me, oh, you know, can you come to Liverpool next week and give a talk? I know that next week I'm far too busy. I've got loads of things to do. I can't possibly go to Liverpool. If someone says, can you come to Liverpool next February and give a talk? Then I'll probably say yes, thinking, oh, that'll be fine. I'll, I'll make time by then. That'll be fine. Whereas, in fact, when it gets to that week, I'll be thinking, I can't possibly fit in going to Liverpool. What am I thinking? Why did I agree to that? So um, in a sense, we're very bad at, at guessing how long things will take. You can do it better by imagining they're going to be the next week or by getting someone else to do it because we're very good at guessing how long other people's things will take. Mm -hmm. So although, we're very, although we optimistically think we can get our kitchen all done in a week and it'll all be done and lovely, other people will tell us straight away, oh, it'll take longer than that. So well, that, and that, that kind of issue, <laughs> which I think behavioural economists talk about in terms of our, our discount rate, is, mm. is, of course, an issue for policymakers. Mm. So the, the big time question for policymakers is how do we get people to do today what they say that they want to do in the long term, and that's the justification, for example, for the fact that the new pension system next year will be an auto-enrolment system where you have to opt out rather than opting in based mm. upon what uh, nudge theorists call changing our choice architecture. So what do you think, are there other implications of understanding our idiosyncratic approach to time for policymakers? I think there are. I mean, I think one of the things that uh, governments should take notice of is that um, because we take notice of the initial features and then actually it wears off how much we mind about things. And so in fact, whenever a government is new, they should do all the boldest things first because 
we will forget by the time the next election comes around. Well, and people do get used to bold things. It depends yeah. whether you get Making used to it. a little political point. It depends whether you get used to it or not. So something like um, a ban on smoking in public places was unpopular with some smokers. The surveys that have been done since show that it's less unpopular with those smokers now. You know, the actual reality of it, they've got used to it. So in a way, people sh they should do their really bold things at the beginning, particularly if they're good things, obviously.